My name is Wendy Absalom. I teach here at Drisha. This week's Parsha is Parshat Amor. Towards the end of the Parsha, there's a very curious incident. It occurs in the middle of chapter 24. We're told, Vayitze ben Isha Yisraelit, Buhu ben Ishmitzri. We're told that a, a man who was the son of an Israelite woman and of an Egyptian man went out, Betoch ben Israel, in the midst of the people of Israel. Vayinatsu ben ha-Yisraelit v'isha Yisraelit. And a fight breaks out in a camp between this man who's the son of the Israelite woman and the Egyptian man, and another man who's an Israelite. Uh, then we're told in verse 11, Vayikov ben isha ha-Yisraelit et Hashem vayikalel. The, uh, the man who is the son of the Israelite woman and the Egyptian man curses God's name. Um, and uh, the people then bring him, and they set watch over him until God tells them what to do. And then God reveals that the punishment for one who curses God is to be stoned. And, um, and in fact, that is, that is what happens to him. Um, now, it's a very curious story. It's not at all clear who this man is. It's not clear why he's cursing God. Um, we do know that the very act of cursing God is understood to be tragedy. The Gemara in Tractate Sanhedrin says that anybody who hears God's name being cursed has to tear their garments as a sign of mourning. Uh, we know from the book of Eov that um, the act of cursing God is almost a death wish. When Eov is suffering for a long time, his wife says to him, you should, uh, you should curse God and die. Right? There's a sense that a person who curses God has sort of given up hope of, of life, and, and the very act of hearing God's name being cursed is understood to be you know, an unimaginable tragedy to all, all those who hear it. Um, but the, the Parsha doesn't at all tell us why, why this man is cursing God, right? We don't really know what, what has brought him to this, to this state. Um, there's an interesting Midrash in Bayagaraba that suggests a, a potential reason. Um, the Midrash notices that we're told um, who this man's parents are. We're told that he has an Israelite mother and an Egyptian father. And the Midrash imagines that the reason, the reason for the fight is that uh, Rabbi Chia teaches Mi Parsha Yuchsin Yetza, that he, um, the the, the man sort of went out as a result of, uh, of a discussion about pedigree, that, um, or lineage, I should say. Uh, that basically this man, uh, we're told afterwards, his mother is Shlomit ben Divri Dan. His mother is uh, Shlomit from the tribe of Dan. And so this man wants to go and pitch his tent amongst all of the people of the tribe of Dan. The people of the tribe of Dan say to him, no, no, you have no place here. Um, they say that, uh, they quote the verse, they say that each person should be encamped um, the Beit Avotam by the house of their fathers, according to the family of their fathers, below the Beit Imotam, and not according to their, the, the houses of their mothers or the families of their mothers. And so his mother was from Dan, but not his father, and therefore they, they have no place for him. According to the Midrash, he takes his case to the, to the Beit Din of Moshe, to Moshe's court. Um, Moshe's court decides as well that the tribe of Don is only for those whose fathers come from the tribe of Don. Um, and in the end, the man is so upset by this judgment that he, that he curses God. Um, and, I, and I think one of the things that the Midrash is sort of imagining happening here is that what's being described is a person who doesn't have any place to be, right? He's, he's searching for somewhere to be in the camp, and he's told that there, there really isn't a place for him. And at this moment of not being able to find a place, he, he so much gives up on, uh, on his ability to be within the community that he curses God, and in doing so, it ends, ends his life. Um, now, it's not so clear why um, it's not so clear why the people of Don don't want him there. Right? What difference does it make? They're in the desert. There's plenty of room. Right? Why, why would they not want this man to be encamped among them? Um, there actually are a series of other midrashim that try to answer that question. Right? What is it about this person that makes the people of Don not want him to be there? Um, and both, both of these other midrashim um, kind of notice that uh, the father of this man is described as an Ishmitsri, right, as an Egyptian man. And the Midrash remembers that we had another sort of um, critical story involving an Ishmitsri back in the second chapter of Exodus. If you remember, there was an Ishmitsri, an Egyptian man, who was hitting an Israelite man, and Moshe steps in to save the, uh, the Israelite man and kills the Egyptian man. And the Midrash, both in Vayikarabah and in Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, imagines that this Egyptian man who was killed by Moshe is in fact the father of this man later on who curses God. And um, both Midrashim sort of explain that the way that this Egyptian man came to father this other person was, uh, was rather unpalatable. And one, in one story in Vayikarabah, um, the uh, Egyptian taskmaster sends the Israelite man off to work and then seduces his wife, that would be Shlomit Batibri, and the child of that uh, that 
seduction is, is this man who curses God. Um, according to that version of the story, basically the Israelite man finds out that the Egyptian taskmaster has been having this affair with his wife, and that's why the Egyptian taskmaster is trying to, to, uh, to beat the Israelite man to death as a way of keeping him silent about it. Um, in another version, the version of Pekir de Rabbi it's not even a, a seduction, it's an outright attack on, on the woman. Um, who, uh, so not only does he attack the woman, but he also then the Egyptian man also then attacks attacks the father. Um, but basically, one can understand if one thinks about this Jewish regime why the people of Dan don't want this man living among them. He his presence is a very painful reminder of their time in Egypt. It's a painful reminder of how vulnerable they were to the Egyptians, um, and we can sort of see why they might they might not want him living with them. Um, but I think, on the other hand, the story sort of makes the point that. He's also one of them. He's the child of one of their daughters, and there there has to be room for him somewhere. And that if there isn't, uh, if they can't find space for him, it seems that the tragedy ensues for everybody. Um, and so I think that maybe one of the one of the points of this story is that even even people who um, who make us uncomfortable or people who remind us of, of painful experiences, there has to be some way for the community to find a space for them. Um, it can't be that everybody tells them that there's no room for them. There always has to be some ability to find to find a place for them to be. Um, and I think that that's true both of um, both of people who make us uncomfortable and remind us of painful things, and also uh, perhaps you know the parts of ourselves that make us uncomfortable or that remind us of maybe painful experiences that we've had in the past. There has to be some way to sort of find a space for that, some way to find a, a place for either those memories to be or for those people to exist. Um, and I think the pressure cautions us that if we if we're not willing to do that, then um, then uh, it could it could result in tragedy. So I guess my hope is for all of us that we are able to. Uh, find a place for every person and a space for all the parts of ourselves that we want to hold on to. Shabbat Shalom.